Today, Mike Tyson took the stand in a dramatic bid to refute charges he raped a young woman. America's boxing superstar is now in the fight of his life. A trial that may determine whether Mike Tyson will ever step into the ring again. This is ABC News Nightline. Substituting for Ted Koppel and reporting from New York, Forrest Sawyer. This has been a season for examining the dark side of the American psyche. In a short span, we have witnessed a Supreme Court nominee accused of sexual harassment, a medical student and member of the nation's most prominent political family accused of rape, and now this, one of the best-known sports figures in the world, also accused of rape. And whether he's guilty or innocent of this charge, there is something especially heartbreaking about the spectacle of Mike Tyson. We want to believe in the American dream that a boy could fight his way out of the slums to become a champion and role model. Instead, after Tyson's meteoric rise, he has fallen back into the atmosphere, burning all the way, tumbling from one bad scene to another, on his way to today's fight, just to stay out of prison. Mike Tyson has become a different kind of model, a symbol of how easily the best hopes can go wrong. How could a young man who can fight so hard fare so badly? First, some perspective from Nightline correspondent Jeff Greenfield. It is a startling, mesmerizing event. A figure so celebrated, so famous around the world, facing a charge as serious as this one. 25-year-old Mike Tyson, the youngest man ever to become heavyweight champion of the world, spoke in public today, not in an attempt to regain his title, nor to explain a dispute with a trainer or with the press. He was in Indianapolis, Indiana, testifying in his own defense against a charge of rape, a charge that could land him in prison for the next 63 years. His 18-year-old accuser has said that Tyson met her at the Miss Black America pageant in Indianapolis last July, lured her to his hotel room, and raped her. Here's what she said when she called 911 the next day. I'm confident that I'm innocent. I'm proved that I'm innocent. Tyson's defense is that there was consensual sex. His defense team has produced witnesses saying that the accuser willingly dated Tyson and that she was openly affectionate with him. But even the defense is not painting Tyson in wholly favorable colors. His own witnesses have described the fighter as making suggestive comments and gestures to many of the young women at the pageant. Behavior his lawyers imply should have warned the accuser of what he had in mind. Tyson along the ropes doing damage. Tyson's rape trial is only the latest link in a chain of misfortune that has grown almost from the day in late June of 1988, when the 22-year-old with a devastating punch demonstrated his undisputed claim to the heavyweight championship of the world by knocking out Michael Spinks in 91 seconds of the first round. What followed was an angry break with his longtime manager, a car crash, rumored to be a suicide attempt, an assault on a TV camera crew, and the breakup of his marriage to actress Robin Givens, which featured this extraordinary admission by Givens on national television. It's been torture. It's been pure hell. Then in February of 1990, the man they called Iron Mike lost his title to the unknown Buster Douglas in one of the most shocking upsets in boxing history. Most analysts say he has not been the same fighter since. He has the qualities, the talent physically, but as you well know, it takes a lot more than that. It takes a lot of mental discipline, and those qualities may be lacking and, and fatally lacking in terms of him ever achieving any kind of greatness. It all has the flavor of a fairy tale gone bad, a distasteful turn in a plot line of struggle, redemption, and triumph that's right out of a movie. Here's how the movie version would go. You take a kid from the Brownsville section of Brooklyn, New York, a neighborhood of projects and tenements, where this kid finds himself in big-time trouble before he's old enough to shave. He's saved from a life of crime by the intercession of a living legend of boxing, looking for one last champion. His name was Customato, who'd made a heavyweight champion out of Floyd Patterson decades earlier. In Tyson, D'Amato saw a young boy with incredible promise trying to overcome an incredibly troubled background. 
Brownsville, Brooklyn is a bad, bad, tough, hard place. The kids carry 9 millimeter pistols. There's a prevalent, almost a gangster culture there, you know? And uh, Mike's from that. Mike's from that, and he, and he courts that. Journalist Jack Newfield remembers Mike Tyson recalling his Brownsville boyhood. He described how when he was 12, his M.O. on the streets of Brownsville and Bed-Stuy was to stand outside the supermarket and pretend to be a sweet, nice kid and offer to carry packages for old ladies back to the projects. And once he got them alone in the elevator, he would knock them out and steal their pocketbook. D'Amato took young Tyson up to the Catskills in upstate New York. He honed Tyson's skills, turned him into the most feared fighter of his generation. But even before the death of Customato, there were those who felt a dark side of Mike Tyson had never been fully conquered. Those of us who knew Mike from the beginning always had a sense of foreboding, always had a sense that he was a time bomb. And I always remembered one of Customato's favorite expressions, which was, round people don't die square. That dark side, some argue, was unleashed when his longtime mentors died and when controversial fight promoter Don King took over Tyson's career. What is unquestionable is that he's gotten into more public trouble with King than he did with the other guys. There is, of course, a sharply different view of Mike Tyson that has been much in evidence in Indianapolis during this trial. The view of Tyson as a victim, persecuted for his skin color and his fame. Outside the courtroom, at rallies, his supporters and his entourage paint a portrait of a figure the establishment wants to destroy, an image Mike Tyson embraces. You know I, mean? I fight with God, or God I can't lose, and I love you all. Thank you. But even those who have long admired his boxing skills fear for Mike Tyson's future, regardless of the trial's outcome. Right now, at this stage, I'm not sure anybody, I'm not sure even he knows what it would take to turn his life around. Predicting the outcome of a criminal trial is just about impossible. Predicting the end of the Mike Tyson story may be less impossible. He clearly had the stuff of which heroes are made. But heroes who never learn that they too must live within limits are heroes headed for a very unhappy ending. Jeff Greenfield for Nightline in Brooklyn, New York. And joining us now is Sonia Steptoe. She is a reporter for Sports Illustrated who has been covering the Tyson trial in Indianapolis. Ms. Steptoe, I suppose there's an unfortunate tendency in these trials to uh, follow them as sporting events and to report on them as they progress. Perhaps that's encouraged by television. It's not a very good idea, but still seasoned court watchers have a sense of how each side is doing. Do you, do you, do you have a feel for the courtroom? Well, I do, and it's, it's actually very, fairly readily apparent that uh, the prosecution still seems to have the momentum, even though they uh, rested their case several days ago. Well, the accuser was a strong witness by all accounts. Do you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. She was very convincing. And now, of course, the, the defense had to, I suppose, in the face of that, put Tyson on the stand. That's right. In addition to her, her mother took the stand and in very moving testimony, she wept while she was testifying, talked about the changes uh, in her daughter's personality as a result of the alleged attack. Was Tyson a strong witness? Well, he, well, in a way he wasn't. I mean, he's certainly a strong presence, but Forrest, I tell you, he whispered today on the stand. It was it was really hard to hear him. He fairly whispered. And you would expect that facing this kind of a charge, um, he had to tell the most important story of his career, that he would want to fairly shout it from the mountaintops. But instead, he spoke very softly. And I, I don't know that he was able to capture the juror's attention quite the way the young woman was able to last week. Do you get the sense that this trial is going to come down finally to whether the jurors choose to believe the accuser or Tyson? Absolutely, absolutely. You cannot um, believe one part of one story and one part of the other. They are so vastly different. It's as if those two people were in different rooms on that evening. And I think the jury's going to have to believe either her or him. What's left at this point? What's left at this point is the cross-examination of Mike Tyson. And that is going to be really tough for him. Because today he was essentially led through his testimony by Vincent Fuller, his attorney. Um, Monday, well actually starting tomorrow, we've got Saturday uh, sessions here. Tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. he's going to be cross-examined by Gregory Garrison, the special prosecutor in this case. And he's tough. 
So we're not likely to see this go to jury until till Monday, probably? Uh, that, that would be my guess, yeah. Sonia Steptoe with Sports Illustrated. Thanks very much, Sonia. We'll be back here in just a moment. When we come back, we will talk with the author of a book on the pressures and dangers boxers face, both inside the ring and out. And we'll also talk with Jose Torres, a former light heavyweight champion. Torres has written a controversial biography of Mike Tyson, an account that has led Tyson to call Torres a traitor. Joining us from our Washington studio is Ralph Wiley, the author of Serenity, a boxing memoir and a former writer for Sports Illustrated magazine. And from our New York studios, former light heavyweight champion Jose Torres. Torres has known Tyson for over a decade. Jose, you, you have known Mike Tyson in good times and bad. It's been a stormy relationship, I know. But is the man that you are hearing about in the courtroom the same man that, that you knew? Well, uh, at the beginning when I first met him, which was when he was before 13, he looked very shy. And he was, he was a man with a great potential from the beginning. Six months after I met him, I knew that he would become heavyweight champion of the world. And Coach Diamato was very confident that if he maintained, if Tyson maintained the desire that he had and the interest that he had in becoming somebody, that he would become champion. Well, you, you heard Jack Newfield, who is a, a writer here in New York, say that uh, Mike Tyson used to talk about the violent times that he had growing up there in, in that neighborhood, which was an awfully tough neighborhood. And there are those critics of Tyson who say, look, the man was violent inside and outside the ring all along. This kind of thing was inevitable. Do you agree with that? No, because what you do, Cus was flabbergasted when he found out, Cus de Amaro, that Tyson had these qualities, that he was a cheater, that he was a pickpocket, that he was so mean in the street. And he just transferred all those qualities, uh, quote unquote, into Tyson the fighter. And then Cus engineered and constructed a, a machine that would be unbeatable inside the ring. And uh, I don't think that Tyson was committing those crimes or after he became a fighter outside the ring. Well, yeah, but let's set aside what's happening in this courtroom because right now Mike Tyson is an innocent man under our law. But there are enough documented cases of, of a man who has been running along the edge and who has been on the brink of violence and so many cases now that we see a man who's very difficult to control himself outside the ring, don't we? Absolutely. I, I became aware of that when I was doing research for the book and when I sat down with, with Tyson for hours and hours. He used to call me at my room to come and see him that he wanted to tell me stuff. And at the time, I thought that Tyson was trying to overcome that violence that, that he had and that now with cause the matter, that he was trying, that he would learn to control that violence outside the ring as well as he does inside the ring. Because Tyson is one of the best fighters I have ever seen in my life. And, and that is due to the fact that he has control of emotions inside the ring. Mr. Wiley, you, do you think that Mike Tyson is getting a fair shake in Indianapolis? Well, of course not, Forrest. I mean, don't be ridiculous. Um... Well, I mean, here you're often quick to say, of course not. Here, there are a lot of people who think that here that's in a fair Washington, trial. Here in Washington, well, I guess the trial will speak for itself in the end. I'm reminded of an old Billie Holiday song called Strange Fruit. Here in Washington, um, five members of the Washington Capitals hockey team were supposedly accused of rape a year or so ago. The whole thing was dropped quickly. St. John's soccer players, lacrosse players, hockey players, I don't know what they were acquitted of rape. William Kennedy Smith, similar, similar situation, acquitted of rape. If Mike Tyson is convicted of rape in the same scenario, and this is probably something women should discuss, then you have a double standard. But looking at it... What, what do you mean? A, why, why is that a double standard? Because he's black? Well, Forrest, that would be for you to figure out. Well, is that what you're saying? I think that would be for you to figure out. I think the, the similarities are, are the same, except well, I don't want to discuss Mike Tyson's case because he's paying lawyers a lot of money. And I think money is important here. I mean, Jose Torres got his pound of flesh from Mike Tyson with fire and fear. There are a lot of lawyers getting their pound of flesh from Mike Tyson right now. And I wonder how long it'll take for a civil suit to be filed against Mike Tyson after the con 
conviction is probably gotten in this case. I wonder. Well, Ms. Tepto, you're watching the trial. That, that's a, those are strong words to be said about how this is going. If he's found guilty, it is a, an indication of a double standard. I, you're not saying, Mr. Wilder, but I'm assuming you're, you're saying it's because of race. Ms. Tepto, what do you say about that? Well, I know, Ralph, and I don't really have an opinion about that, uh, that side of this case. I can only tell you what's going on inside the courtroom. And this is, after all, a criminal proceeding. This young woman feels that she was the victim of a crime and she is asking the legal system for its retribution in the criminal under the criminal justice system do you feel that it's proceeding as fairly as you as you're able to determine and you're you're a graduate of duke law school is it fair is that what you asked does it seem to be fairly handled fairly handled yes i think so all right let's stop there let's move on and talk about boxing and the kinds of pressures that take place in boxing when we continue our discussion in just a moment subject is Mike Tyson and the pressures of boxing. Jose, how old was Tyson when he first started boxing? He was around 12, and he, and he was in jail when he first boxed with the coach who had been trained by Cus before, and he, when he saw the potential of, of this young kid, he took him to Cus. How in the world can, can a boy who has had the experiences that he had growing up and then is suddenly introduced into the bright lights of boxing and instantly vaulted to that kind of fame and the millions and millions of dollars that are at stake and the pressures and the pushes and the pulls, how can anybody expect him to, to keep his feet? It is amazing because at the level that Tyson is right now, you have to have an incredible complex mind because at this stage, it is no longer a contest of physical abilities, but a contest, a, a contest of character and desire because at that, at that stage, the physical ability is about the same among all the top contenders and the champion. And Tyson was so smart, and, so, and I'm talking about intellectually smart, that he was able to, to deal with the pressures of boxing, even though it was very hard to live with him in training camp. He used to go berserk uh, two and three weeks before. And I remember Steve Lott and, uh, and Kevin Rooney going crazy with this kid because the pressure used to get to him. And, and they, they, they educated him. He was learning more and more. And then, of course, the whole, th the whole thing went bad when he decided, when he, when he was lured by uh, Duncan to leave uh, the old family. M Mr. Wiley, I saw you kind of shaking your head at one point there. Well, Aren't these pressures extraordinary? Yes, but Mike Tyson is not singular. If you look back at heavyweight champions, I think with the possible exception of Muhammad Ali, they all had very tough, very difficult backgrounds. You don't become the heavyweight champion of the world by singing soprano in the gospel choir at church. Uh -huh. It requires a very difficult, difficult, hard sort of life because, let's face it, who fights people that have nothing to lose, basically? You don't become heavyweight champion of the world the same way you are on the track to become a Supreme Court justice. So I think it's a little unfair to try to portray Tyson as an anomaly I think most heavyweight fighters have had very difficult, very hard, bordering on criminal, if not criminal, backgrounds. To, to, so to try to say that Mike Tyson is somewhat different I, because I, this is in his background is I, I, I patently be, ludicrous. I, I believe that, the, that that's a myth that has been spread from the beginning of boxing. And because most fighters are poor, Hispanics, and blacks that has been a condition implanted in the mind of many that you have to be a criminal or a former criminal to be the heavyweight champion of the world. I think if you check, the most sensitive people I have ever met in my life has been fighters, champions of any weight. And we're talking now about like today we have 30 champions of the world. Check to see if their backgrounds were that hard. A fighter, a champion of the world must have an incredible intellectual capacity to become to be champion of the world and to face the pressure you need someone very special in the head well it's, it sounds to me it sounds to me as if jose is lobbying for a new manager with, with mike tyson and that will change everything about him it sounds as if that's what he's he's attempting well, to portray no, 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 listen to this cost the amato when he had uh, but cost the amato is dead when he so, had no no wait a minute when he had tyson tyson was a different person when 
Bill Caton and Steve Lutt. Wait, are, are, are you I trying to say, Jose, basically that you think that this all comes back to Don King, and once Don King began to represent him, then, then problems began? I think no problem did not begin, but the problem got worse with Tyson because so if, Don, if, wait, wait, because Don King if, is not there to protect Mike Tyson's best interest. Don King is there, yeah, and rightly fights. so, to to look to for the fights. best interest of Don King. All right, Mr. And that's normal, and that's... But Bill Caton isn't. Of course, Bill Caton and his oh, retinue we, are there to look after Mike Tyson. Absolutely. Let, let, me just, let me just interject here. We've only got a few minutes. Bill Caton is his former, man, is his former manager, a man that Mike Tyson left. He has gone to Don King, who is very well known in, in the fight business now for as a representative. For Go us, ahead, it comes Mr. Down to this. Every, everybody that you talk to about Mike Tyson is going to have some sort of vested interest, is going to have some sort of personal call. Well, the thing In is, Sonia's case, Sonia's a woman. She feels very put upon, I'm sure, as a woman. But to try to say Mike Tyson is the man, is the one man that has pained women is false. All right, Hose Ms. Uh, Steptoe, we've got about 15 seconds, and since you were brought into this, you better <laughs> jump in here. <laughs> um, do I feel pained by this? Uh, I'm just an interested observer, uh, Forrest and Ralph. Um, I, I think it's it's what's in, what's interesting to me is the defense Quickly. that Tyson's lawyers are raising that he is um, right. the stereotypic uh, 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 view of a black forgive me athlete. folks but we, we are right out of time Jose I'm very very sorry I thank you Bye. all for talking with us and we uh, will be back in just a moment <laughs>